Welcome to the Hard But Worth It podcast, where we explore the leader's journey. I'm Kirk. I'm Mitch. And on this episode, we're going to ask the question, what are you all about and why the hell does it matter? Because the world depends on it. <laughs> <laughs> you are that important. That's right. right. <laughs> What is this question? We've talked about this question before when we talk about the icon framework and how we go about helping people walk through creating value in the world. And we have this third question. It's usually framed as our third question, which is the, what are you all about? And I'm wondering if you can bring us into why you think that question is important. Yeah. Well, we know that when, once you know where you are mm -hmm. and you've identified at least the next destination of where you want to go, that becomes a clear objective. And, and of course, the next question is, how are you going to get there? What's the route? And in that, how is often going to be shaped by what kind of vehicle yeah. are you going to be traveling in? Mm -hmm. You know, where, where, you, where you are and where you want to go is one thing, but how you get there is based on, well, what vehicle are you going? Are you taking a train? Are you taking a plane? Are you going to be driving a car? If you are driving a car, like we, like we like to say to our clients is you are the vehicle. Yeah. You are the vehicle that's actually going to be traveling this road to where you want, the want question, to where you're going. And you need to know what kind of vehicle you are because that's going to help impact or shape the, the route you take or the path that you pick, right? Yeah. And, and in practical terms, I think about that being the kind of company you build. Yeah. A leader has an incredible, or a leadership team sometimes have incredible impact on the kinds of people they attract, the kind of clients they attract, the kind of products that they're yeah. willing to put out. And this is all somehow in this, what are you all about question. I was working with someone this week um, and we we're sitting talking through a, um, a leadership, part of his leadership journey and how he's trying to d do development with one of his people. He hired someone a year ago and they've, it's going well, but he sees that, okay, there's some gaps and we need to work on this and all this kind of stuff. And as we're talking through this, we developed a plan on how he's going to approach this that suits him. It's not precisely how right. I would do it. Right. But it's who he is. And as we were doing that, I, we got that plan laid out. And then I, I said, he was feeling really comfortable with like, yeah, I can do that. That makes sense. And it was so his voice that I said, do you recognize that we just described the way you're going to lead the company, the way you're going to lead this team in your style? Yeah. And he was like, what do you mean by that? We started talking about it. And it reveals this idea that I think a lot of people, when they think about a leader, they think about an avatar of what is the, what does a leader look like? Right. And we'll often use the language, oh, that person is a natural born leader as though it's something you can be born with. Yeah. <laughs> well, that means that some people just aren't natural born leaders and maybe I don't, you know, but I don't think leadership is a personality style. Right. I think it's a style that suits your personality. Yeah. And you get to pick and you get, to, but you have to figure this question out to be able to do yeah. that. Yeah. And I love that too, because so often, especially as we grow in our leadership journey, what tends to happen is if you outgrow your uh, position or yeah. you outgrow the leader who's above you, then sometimes the conversation, uh, acknowledging that friction is more about you're right or I'm wrong or I'm right or yeah. you're wrong rather than just acknowledging the fact that at this point we're different. Right. And maybe the best way we run together is we need to pick different paths. At this point we separate, but it's actually championing each other and celebrating the differences rather than making about you're wrong, I'm right, mm -hmm. my way or the highway, which we know works for a period of time. But eventually what <laughs> yeah. tends to happen, if that's the kind of leader we are, our strong leaders who grow leave our environments. We don't tend to keep them. Good leadership cultures love to empower that type of sense of, hey, wait, no, actually you're leading, you're growing, you're challenging me because your way's different. But hey, if I get out of the way, mm -hmm. you'll probably take this further, make it faster, make mm -hmm. it longer than I could ever do. 
So let me go ahead and champion that. Then you keep those people, those that talent on your team as yep. well. And you let them lead. You let them lead. Have their styles and things like that. And so knowing, and this actually gets to something we were talking about over lunch today, which is critical. I'm going to steal it from you, even though you said it first, <laughs> but I'll give you credit right here. But as we were talking about this question, what are you all about? You, you said something to the effect of, well, doesn't that apply to other people as well? What right. is your team? And, and I think, you know, yes, that was a brilliant insight that when you... When you are figuring out who you are, that's helpful, but it helps us also begin to see other people and who yeah. they are and those differences and differentiations that actually is necessary to building high quality yeah. teams. Yeah. And I think when we do that, we see things then also rather than competing, yeah. we see them as opportunities to complement. Yep. Differences are bad or good based on our view of our own self-awareness, but also becoming more self-aware yep. of others. And we see that first in our marriages, right? Yeah. Right? <laughs> <Shh>. <laughs> Definitely. Yeah. So, Definitely. so pull us in. Today we, we wanted to talk about, from our last episode, we spoke about maybe getting into some of the ways that we can personally mm -hmm. discover who we are. And there's a lot of typing, yep. you know, tools out there, Yeah. Uh, but we were going to dig into the Myers-Briggs a bit, because this we found, even though this is an older one, it is super helpful in giving us kind yeah. of a, a, a lens to look through and how we might be wired, but also how others on our team might be wired. Yeah. So yeah, we talked in, a, in the episode where we were talking about finding your why, we said there are four different sort of attributes or places right. to look. There was personality, your humanity, how how your home works, and then your own distinctive story. And this is the personality yeah. side of it. And there's been lots of work over the last hundred or so years um, in what's called trait personality that we are beginning to under, we have actually significant understanding of these personality traits that different people carry. And then over time, we've developed all these surveys, personality tools, many of which have gotten branded up into things like strength finders and disc and enneagram and myers briggs and the big five and they go on and on so and many new ones keep coming yeah, out it's interesting right pick one yeah <laughs> um so the myers briggs actually is one of the oldest ones like you're mentioning and it's built on carl jung's work it goes way back and then there's two guys named myers and briggs enhanced it and brought it forward to us um and it remains a pretty useful tool but one of the things to start with when doing personality trait work to figure out this question, who are you and what are you all about? I would say it's a great tool to get started with. It can answer all kinds of useful, big picture questions. Because what those things are basically doing is giving you an avatar to think about and compare yourself to. So the Myers-Briggs breaks the world down into 16 different categories, types. Um, DISC has four, Strength Finders has 32, Enneagram has nine. They're all a little different, but what they all do is make buckets. Mm -hmm. And then they put you in a bucket. And I like to yeah. tell clients all the time a couple things. Number one, as long as anytime you're breaking the human experience down into 16 buckets, you've made a terrible mistake. <laughs> like, <laughs> But it turns out it's a very useful mistake. Right. And so I don't like the notion that once I know my Myers-Briggs or my Enneagram, I know who I am. Yeah. No. But you do have some clues because these are, these are archetypes that we can then compare ourselves to. Um, another metaphor we'll talk about in coaching sessions when we're breaking this down for people is it's kind of like the color wheel. And the color wheel does describe a bunch of colors, and that's super helpful. And so what, what these do is they describe a bunch of types of people, which is super helpful. So if you're blue and I'm red, that's good to know, right? But if I go down to the paint store and I say I want red paint, the person mixing it is going to be like, dude, no, I need yeah. a ton more information. Yep. And one, one writer uh, suggests that this is the is infinite degrees of sameness. And I like that language. Yeah. Right? There's something similar. Like you and I have very similar personalities. Mm -hmm. We can test for it, and it's going to be obvious. And yet I can still tell where you're different than me and the nuances and flavors. And you're red, I'm red, great, but we're different reds, right? right? So when doing this type of work, this isn't a way of answering the question, what are you all about? It is certainly a way to get some really good good clues. Yeah. And it's useful, again, not to box us in or label us, mm -hmm. but it's useful to get us a starting point first to know, oh, this may be why I tend to be dispositioned this way. Yep. And it doesn't mean that I, I get stuck in that as if that's 
all I ever play to the rest of my life, but it actually starts to show areas maybe where you can grow mm -hmm. to complement or compensate or why you may need others on your team, Yeah. right? Yeah. If, you, if you're if you extremely, like for example, we we're gonna talk through them in a minute, but if you're extremely extroverted and that's your entire jam with everyone around, you know, there's, there is something to be brought to the table by the introverts yeah. who show up yeah. and have a way of processing information where maybe extroverts would benefit from having you some of those imagine on the team. that yeah exactly <laughs> two extroverts so here. so let's let's talk through these a bit so okay. there's the e so let's start by saying there the myers briggs is built on four by by dyads, dyads or binaries right. where there's there's a there's two things held on on a continuum um, there's four of those couplets that we'll work through um, the e and the i which is extrovert and introvert and then the S and the N, which is in, N stands for intuitive, S stands for sensing. Then there's the F and the T, feelers and thinkers. And then there's the J and the P, which is judging and perceiving. Mm -hmm. And they sit on continuums. Now, when you get your when you get your results back, you'll find out maybe you're an N. However, what you have to what you have to think about is there's N on one side, S on the other side of a continuum. And there's a zero line in the middle. And that doesn't mean neither. It just means the middle. And so you'll often get language back like you're a 47% preference towards N. And somebody else might come back with a 10% preference towards N. So it's placed both ends on the N half of the scale, but in very different places. And if, uh, like, I'm a 87 or so percent extrovert, my wife is a 1% introvert. So she's an introvert, I'm an extrovert. You can totally tell the difference between us. But one of our sons is probably more like a 70% introvert. So that means there's almost as much difference between him and my wife as between my wife and me. Right. And so knowing how this 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 scale works is really important. Right. So you're using one letter, the N, but really when you take the test, you usually get four correct letters that are a result so, either. Right. So you take the test and you'll get of these of these four different couplets, you're going to get anchored into one of them on all. So you get four letters back. Right. Right. And so your results will say you're an I N T J or for me, I'm an E N T J mm -hmm. and somebody else might be some other combination and the combinations work together to create 16 different types. Right. So that's the basic idea behind Myers-Briggs and most tools have some system like that to get yeah. you into these different combinations of types. So if we think about it, so if we go through them, right, introvert, extrovert, that's one that lots of people have a decent amount of understanding around. Um, but for, to start with, what are you? Yeah. So I'm an ENTP. And I'm an ENTJ. Right. Okay. So we're both E's. We're both, we're both red on some level. <laughs> <laughs> and we go hot. <laughs> that's right. So what does E, what does extrovert mean to you? Extrovert means that um, for me, I get energy. I mean, I think the true definition, and I uh, definitely witness to this, is I get energy being around people yeah. in, in, a, in a group. It doesn't have to be big groups, but like uh, if I'm alone for too long, I actually uh, lose energy. I start to feel sapped. I start to feel you know, maybe not, not sad, but like just a sense of what am I doing? A little restless. Meaningless. Me <laughs> yeah, maybe so. Sorry. So my, yeah. my, my natural default is, hey, let's go get with some friends. Let's go do something. Yeah. And I'm you the same know. way. Yeah. And eyes, introverts are just the opposite. They get energy from being alone. They, they can go out on their own, be, be in solitude and be recharged where for you and I, that actually right. costs us something. Mm -hmm. A lot of people make the mistake that thinking of thinking that means introverts don't really like people. Right. That's not true at all. Introverts just get their battery charged through solitude yeah. and being alone. Yeah. Well, for, like, even for example, my, myself, I am energized around people, mm -hmm. but I still need a good two hours the first part of my day is alone time mm -hmm. because I get focused, I get clear, I get, and, and I wouldn't say that's an introvert in me as much as it's my process for before I go out into the world and I know there's gonna be a million voices, I have a, a, a clar clarifying moment with myself to get clear. Whereas many introverts, 
can show up and be very good socially, mm -hmm. maybe even better than some extroverts. Mm -hmm. Just because you're a good extrovert doesn't mean you have great social skills. No, In fact, it you may you may be really <laughs> poor in your social skills. That's right. That's actually one of the ways it shows up as well is I like to tell people that extroverts process their thinking with their ears. Mm. Yes. They're usually high word count. They'll say seven things out loud in front of people and then pick <laughs> yeah. one of them, right? And introverts process with their lips. Right. So they have an, a rich internal world. They're very connected to what's going on inside of them. And what comes out is what they mean. Which And one of the things that turns into is extroverts can overtalk people all the time. Right. And that's not good social skills. Introverts are often really good at listening. Mm -hmm. And those are excellent social skills. And so to, to just call introverts not good with people... It's, it's not true right. at all. Another mistake people make on this one is they think introverts mean shy. And shy is more about self-esteem. Right. Um, it's not I mean, anything to do with this. Extroverts can be shy. So to label introverts as shy, not good with people, they don't like people, it's completely misunderstanding what an introvert is. Mm -hmm. um, the One of my favorite descriptors of the difference between these has to do with... Um, uh, think about an antenna. So we all have an antenna inside of us that is experiencing the world around us. And introverts have a very big antenna that's really well-tuned and can reach out and grab for a long distance. And extroverts have a little tiny antenna, a little stubby thing, barely works at all. <laughs> and what that means is when, when an extrovert walks into a crowd of people, they can, they're like, they can actually feel all the people because their antenna is getting all this input, all this, and it's fun. It's exciting. They walk around and they're just touching all this stuff that's mm -hmm. going on. When an introvert walks into that crowd, they get overwhelmed by all the data that's coming in, all the signals. They can feel it because their antenna is so big. Right. And so it's exhausting for them. And so they often create what we call the introvert bubble. They create this little shield around them. And uh, my son has one of these. And... Uh, so when I approach as an extrovert, I want to play. I'm like a puppy dog. I'm like, hey, want to, you know, and he's like, ah. And so I've learned to knock on his bubble. Hey, can I come in? And respecting an introvert's bubble is really important. And when they trust you with that, they'll let you in. Otherwise, they're like, nope, you're too much. You're too much. <laughs> Which I've had that feedback. <laughs> yeah, right. um, so this is some of the ways of thinking about extroverts and introverts. And you can start to see how if those two people are on the same team, or in my case, in the same marriage, you got to learn this. you got to dance with this and, and respect it and treat it well. It's I can't communicate with my wife as though she is me. Right. Um, she will say to me, i got about five more minutes. And that yeah. means my word count. That's right. Is overwhelming. Choose her. your words wisely. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. All right. Next one is the intuitive or the N. The reason they use N here is because we've already used I for introvert. So intuitive and sensing, the N and the S. How do you experience that one? Uh, intuitive would be more, I would say, going with like a gut feeling. Yeah. You know, you just, you know, at the end of the day, you just feel it. And typically your gut feeling has a good track record. Intuition you know, you, you is reliable. Some, you so can't speak. always prove it. Mm -hmm. You can't always quantify it. Mm -hmm. uh, whereas um, I'm not a sensor, but I think sensing tends to be a little more collecting of the information and the facts and the pieces that go together with yeah. it. Yeah. One of the ways I've heard this described, it's exactly like that. Um, the sensing is you have, we all know we have five senses, mm -hmm. right? And S's trust those five senses. But we always talk about the sixth sense, mm -hmm. that little spidey sense that yeah. some people have, right? That's the, your intuition. And so S's have that, they just don't necessarily trust it. And N's, the intuitive people, they actually, they have five senses as well, but they actually trust their intuition. More, yeah. Right? They have more confidence in it. And so what that means is when things are happening in the world, an S is more likely to wait until they can touch it, smell it, feel it, like it becomes real in the moment. It becomes concrete in the lived experience. Yeah. And then they're like, there, that that's reliable. Ends have this reaching out into the future thing. This, you know, it's not it's not concrete yet. Right. Um, but I'm gonna act as though it is. Mm -hmm. That's that gut yeah. feeling thing. And 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 it's it's very real. 
that that's the thing. It's it's hard to prove it, but it's very real. Yeah. And I think those who are strong in in and maybe with some of the other uh, visionary type uh, pieces can create such a vivid in ness mm -hmm. mm -hmm. to the future that people believe it. Yeah. Right. People high in belief, uh, I believe, are attached to people who have strong intuition yeah. for that reason. This is the one, this is most of these, it's not precisely true, but most of these split 50-50 in the human experience or close enough to it to make that statement. Um, this one's different though. There's 25% of humans are N's, 75% are S's. So there's way more S's in the world, which is why I think sometimes we think that this N is a leadership trait, that ability to vision the future, right. to see, you know, go up on the mountain and come back with this, you know, great plan and all that kind of stuff. And we and like to think, we like to think, well, that especially happens, as right? two ends, <laughs> yeah, <right. laughs> but it's a, it's, it is a component of leadership. Right. It's a piece of it, but leadership is much bigger than just this ability to sort of craft this visionary future. That's a part of it. But to say that the person makes a better leader is like, eh, I don't, I, I'm not into right. that because I know all kinds of S's that are phenomenal Agreed. leaders. Um, they do it differently. And this is where styles start yeah. to show up again. Um, What's also interesting is if you have an N in your Myers-Briggs re result, by definition, you're in a smaller category of people, and you are you are a bit more rare, and that's important to know. And what that means is it's very common. Um, you see this a lot in churches, and you see it in other organizations where you, you end up having this N visionary person gravitate into the leadership role, then everybody else is a bunch of S's, and then the two go kind of can go to war with each other. Yeah, right. <laughs> right? And that's a, that's something ends have to keep in mind. <laughs> yeah. How do you work with S's? I think it's important to recognize that if you're a heavy, th if you're a thinker, a T, that doesn't mean you don't have feelings. You don't get off the feeling hook. Right? right. But you have a tendency to lead with your thinking. Or if you're a feeler, you tend to lead or trust your feelings. And so it's very easy to profile people on this one because all you have to do is you're having a conversation and you just say, so what do you think about that? And they're yeah. like, uh, you know, it's cool. <laughs> yeah. And then you say, well, how do you feel about it? And they will 20 minutes of, yeah. of they have deep connection to that That's right. or vice versa, right? Yeah. Um, so in the T and the F, which one are you? Uh, I'm a T, yeah. but I think my, uh, I think I'm pretty strong T, but I think that's starting to to wane a bit with my mm. uh, 15 year old, almost 16 year old daughter. Who's an F? Who, who well, clearly mm. she's either an F or she's uh, just generally an F as being <laughs> the age she just, is. Yeah, teenagers. Are... But uh, definitely learning uh -huh. How to... to understand feelings right. Right. and appreciate feelings. Uh, you know, not everything is logical and I can, I can easily appeal to logic and, you know, it just makes sense. Yeah. Not only do I have intuition, but here, here is the case as to why I can line it all out. Yeah. And it doesn't, and my wife's the same way. She, she's actually an E and FP. I'm an E and TP. So you only have one difference and it's this yeah. TF. Thing. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And, and our P's are, are, uh, off. I'm really intense P. Mm. She's not, but, but in the feeler that's a, that's an area where our relationship Pretty is shown different. yep. differences and, you know, opportunity for conflict, but also for me to learn because of my strong personality, you know, to not override, but to learn to actually pull back and go, wait a second, I can tell you're feeling something. I don't do this perfectly, mm -hmm. but the times when I do that in my relationships, especially my wife or my daughter, it pays off huge because then they they tend to open up and come alongside to the thought process. Yeah. And together we make a better decision. It turns out they're they're good they're, thinkers. They yeah. just lead with their feelings. Right? Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Um, I often think about well, actually you just you just brought up a notion that's important. You're a heavy T, but your F is starting to like you feel yourself moderating right. that, right? That's because one of the one of the languages that we'll use around personality is this is the way I'm hardwired, right? I'm just built this way, that kind of thing. And we used to think that way, but we don't anymore. We've disproved that. You're, there's a plasticity to personality. There is fluidity to it. Right. We're able to move um, and make. And so you can think it'll, the test will come back and say, you're a 97% T or some heavy, mm -hmm. significant preference towards T. Now, but you can move that around in your lived experience. You probably can't move it so far that you would be a heavy F. Like this is, that's too yeah. much, right? But you can moderate this stuff. And 
I think that when we take these surveys, I just called it a test, which is a mistake, because a test implies that you could right. fail it. Yeah. <laughs> and you can't fail these. <laughs> there is no wrong answers. That's right. But when we take these surveys, one of the things I always tell clients to do is take it f pretty fast. Don't overthink it. Right. It's your first impulse and be impulsive. Because there's a way in which we're testing your strong preferences, not your maturity. Correct. And, and it depends is a pretty good answer to a lot of things. But what's that first impulse? That's your identifier. Right. And then as we mature and grow, we become more fluid and we're able to navigate, like you're saying, um, because there's there's more important things than being a T in the world. Yeah. Having a good relationship with your daughter, turns out, is more important. Well, and employees, too. I mean, some of your employees, uh, they're not good. You, you can't appeal to them if you're a T uh -huh. through as much of logic or facts. Even though facts are true... Um, feelings are real, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. And feelings, although they're real, are not always true, mm -hmm. right? So That's there is great. a level of that. And so I think as leaders, you know, if you've got someone who's a high F and you're coming at the argument or the case or the point you're trying to make through logic, but they just are feeling misunderstood, which is a lot of times... Um, in leading in, in a in a work environment where that could they just want to be like understand that you feel them you understand yeah, them yeah. and the minute you come over and go okay let me hear what you're saying are you saying you feel this they feel validated then a, a lot of times they'll come over and be able to appreciate mm -hmm. the facts mm -hmm. and make the decision you want them to do or at least you become open to the wider context of what they might be feeling I've even found in those cases sometimes they're pinging something that's in my blind spot right because they're feeling something they may be the loudest feeler but they're actually representing a voice within a multitude or maybe a majority of my company that i'm missing because i'm just so locked locked into the, the logical side Correct. of the equation yeah. yeah that's awesome so t's and f's again need each yeah. other they interact well um and then we go to the j and the p which is actually, if I understand this right, that was the addition Myers and Briggs made to Young's original work. They brought this okay, JP didn't thing. Know that. Yep. And it can be a little bit of the harder one to sort of wrap our minds around, I think. I think people kind of can struggle with this one, or that's been my experience as well. And it could be because one of them is called judging. Yeah. And that's just wrong. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> like, no, we don't do that around here. It's like, well, but we do. <laughs> um, so you can play with words, and maybe discerning is another word you could attach to this. Um and you're a heavy P, right? Yeah. Okay. And I'm a moderate, I'm a slight J. Right. So we're different in this one. Um, how do you experience being a heavy P? I've only lived with that. Yeah. My, my wife is too, and I live with it there. But yeah. how do you experience it? Well, uh, since I became aware of the P, because I didn't, I actually didn't take the Myers-Briggs until about two years ago or mm -hmm. less. Uh, I was a disc uh person and yeah. we can talk about that another another, another great episode, one but, go do discs they're awesome uh, so when i learned i was a p it explained a lot oh. uh, it explained a lot of the own of my own personal pain <laughs> that i inflict on myself uh -huh. Uh -huh. as to why uh i struggle with certain things and it also uh explained a lot of my relationship with you know in my family but also in, in my business and to where um, I was creating stress mm. in my team because part of what the P and the JR is, um, it's all about how you make decisions. And P's tend to be comfortable uh, with letting the decision ride longer. Yeah, that's right. Keeping things open for a longer period of time. Mm -hmm. And sometimes even the bigger the decision, the longer they're willing to let that ride because they want to make sure they're making the best decision and considering all their options. Well, what that can feel to a J is that you're waiting to the last minute and mm -hmm. sometimes to the point of being uh, insensitive because this demands a decision. It's important. Mm -hmm. And so where, it, where, where that creates stress by leaving it open to a J and the more, the more J they are, the more stress that creates, uh, the same way for a P, it creates stress when I would say the decision is finalized, finalized and made too soon. Mm -hmm. There's a level of, wait mm -hmm. a second, 
that's Rashness. creating pressure. Yeah. Like, hey, we got six months. I can make a decision now, but but now there's a lot of little decisions. Whereas, you know, with the J, if the decision's made to go to do a retreat mm -hmm. six months from now, company retreat, I can make the decision six six months out and say, hey, we're going to do this retreat. We're going to go here. Yes, yes, yes. The next day, some of my strongest Js are going. Have you booked the tickets yet? Right. And I'm starting to feel pressure by that. It's like, wait a second. I got six months to book tickets. Right. They're like, no, you don't. I'm like, yeah, I do. So I've learned this question okay. when I have my team around me because all of them are P's except for my uh, co-founder partner who's mm -hmm. also uh, – I'm sorry. All of them are J's okay. except my co-founder partner who's a P. Oh, P. So the two so, of you are P's. Yeah, but all my executive, executive leader and they all, all have J in it, right? Yeah. They're showing up. Yeah, they're executing all right. <laughs> so I've actually learned to ask this question with them to say, hey, okay, so now that we've made the decision – between now and then, how how does the time frame feel to you? Do we have enough time, mm. or do you feel like we're we're running under the gun? And and I'll and we'll have that conversation to define it because I may feel like I've got plenty of time, and they're saying no, we're already late. Right. And it helps me go. Okay, how do we show up in this and find a that's cool a way to so you guys can co-regulate. We can navigate. Yeah, we can regulate and navigate yeah. the stress in it. Yeah, I like that you anchored this one on decision making because that's how I usually explain it. Um, the, the P stands for perceiving, and it's this willingness to go. Okay, I've perceived something, but I could perceive something else which might be useful too. Mm -hmm. And then now I have that piece of information, but there probably is more and I'll wait for that until I get all the information, right? And so for a P, an unhealthy P or, or misuse of P we'll say, is they, they, they actually never make a decision. The mm -hmm. decision is made for them because time ran out. Right. Right. That doesn't work. They avoided no, that, the decision. Yeah. Jays are good at making decisions. They, they feel strong about that. They're, it's often, I'll find myself in a room of peas or a space of peas, and I'll be the J, and it's the classic conversation of, what, what, what do you want to have dinner tonight? And everybody's perceiving each other, and I'm like, finally, it's, I'll just say, I, I end up making the decision. I'm like, we're going to have Mexican at Guadalajara <laughs> yeah, because, right. and they're like, oh, oh, thank God, someone made a decision. I'm like, because it's my job. Yeah, so right? because my wife and I are peas, we never get there. <laughs> <You never. laughs> Three <laughs> weeks to start driving. <laughs> Right. So there's a, there are deciders. They're just the deciders, right? right? That, that's usually a J. Now, the problem is J's feel so comfortable making decisions, they'll make a decision knowing if it's the wrong decision, well, they just make another one mm -hmm. and they'll just make another one and they'll just make another one. And what that turns out is they're making decisions way, like you said, way too soon, way too often. So when they go wrong, there's lots of activity, right? Mm -hmm. But they're not actually going anywhere. And so I always draw a dot, imagine in your mind a dot, and the P is standing on the dot, not making a decision, not going anywhere. It's very obvious. The J is standing on the dot, they make a decision, they go left, and they make a decision, go down, then make a decision, they go to the right, and then they're, and they're, you just get this squirrel of activity, but in fact, they also didn't go anywhere. <laughs> that's right. <laughs> right? So th that's how they break down. Yeah. And then you can also see that you can have some real functional uses of these tools as well yeah um but again it points to if you've got both like you were describing both of these in relationships on teams operating we have to understand our preference the preference of the other and when to lean on which and mm -hmm. how to do this dance because yeah. totally. p's and j's just communicate very differently they do and and what i've learned in becoming self-aware of that is i've learned to uh let go of certain tasks that i thought would burden because they're stressful to me oh, uh, yeah. that they'd burden other people but i've actually learned no they actually want that mm -hmm. so let them we made a decision let them send the meeting invite out and coordinate the entire meeting now and get all that i, I don't i'm not gonna they're no they know me the meeting invite's not gonna come out till an hour before the meeting oh <laughs> yeah. here's the link everyone yeah. and they're like they wanted it two weeks ago right so i love now to be able to hand those off knowing i'm not actually adding stress I'm actually alleviating stress mm -hmm. to those on my team who want to do that. And they're actually doing work for me that I probably wouldn't do to the last right. minute anyway. And they like it. It's, it's the kind right. of work that is, it's worth it right? yeah. in our language. All right. So now we have, we have a basic understanding of how these, these different couplets work. Um, sometimes people will look at these and go, oh, so I need to find people I'm compatible with. 
And I'm like, no, probably, probably not super right. helpful. Um, for instance, I'm an ENTJ. My wife is an ISFP. We are opposites on this. That does create miscommunication often. Like we, we miscommunicate in all four areas. Yeah. <laughs> and when you have similarity with somebody, it's easier to maybe navigate that. But it doesn't mean that we're not compatible. Um, in the same way that two extroverts who end up marrying each other have to figure out how to do alone time and they don't have someone there to teach them, they have to, that's not necessarily helpful either. And so a lot of this is not about compatibility. It's about understanding how somebody else thinks and then valuing it right. and learning how it works and paying attention to it and, and making room for that. Mm -hmm. Well, and even as you said, the spectrums, like you have, uh, you may have two E's, but you were talking about yeah. your, your son and your wife. I mean, you're an E, right. she's an I, but she's closer to the E. And then uh -huh. you have your son who's way out here as an I. Yeah. So even, even in that difference, you know, you may be E, but you're way different in that color yeah. spectrum. That's right. Yeah. Now, we've talked about numerous different survey, personality trait survey mm -hmm. tools you can use, and there are lots of them. Some of them I like better than others, but most of them are great. Yeah. Um, one of the things we do at Icon with clients is we'll often run them through multiple of these, maybe not all at once, but over time, because it softens the edges of the language. You start to get these different lenses and facets and ways yeah. of talking about yourself. But in the, at the end of the day, what you've run into is your how your personality might work and how it works in, broad, in a broad sense. But we all have to then do the work of answering the question, what am I all about more precisely? And we'll talk about that more in future episodes. But this tool of whether it's the Myers-Briggs or the Enneagram or the Big Five or DISC or yeah, these tools help us get moving down the down right. this direction. Uh, we'll leave a link in the show notes of where you can actually take the Myers-Briggs for free. You'll get your four letters back and then it will give you a couple, two or three, maybe four pages of things to think about ways that this shows up, how it helps, how it hurts, how it builds base motivations. And you can use those as ingredients in, in answering the question, what are you all about? But don't think just because I got called an ENTJ yeah. that that's the answer, yeah. right? It's on the way to an answer. What's cool about it is it's really, really helpful. Really helpful <laughs> and fun. I have found, uh, just as we wrap here, mm -hmm. uh, bringing it into your team, uh, no matter which one you pick, because all you're trying to do is not lock on the one right way. Right. It's as much as you're just trying to get the conversation going. Yeah. And what's fun about it is you can you can begin to see if you do it in a in a in a healthy proactive way why some of the friction has been there. It actually becomes kind of hilarious at times. You go, <laughs> oh, now I understand yeah. because I, I I you're this way and I'm this way. We can come together now and learn how to complement and cooperate mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. rather than rather than feeling like we're in conflict all the time. Where one is right and one is Where wrong. Where one is right and what is wrong. Yeah. Correct. There is no way to fail this test. So enjoy taking the Myers-Briggs, and we'll see you on the next episode of Hard But Worth It.